Good morning and welcome. I'm Brandon Laws. I'll be moderating today's webinar. This is the first part of a four part webinar series about returning to work. So this one is preparing to reopen the workplace. This is a panel discussion and Q and A. So we'll answer all your questions and thank you for submitting the questions. We have 191 people signed up today and a lot of you submitted great questions. So we weave that into the panel discussion for today uh, with uh, Susie Weir, Luke Reese, and Alicia Young. And we'll, we'll answer a lot of your questions throughout the presentation that were submitted in advance, but please use the, the Q&A window on, on Zoom and submit more questions. We'll, we'll leave time at the very end, probably 15 minutes or so at the very end, and answer a lot of your questions that are popping up on, in your mind uh, as, we, as we go throughout this presentation. So a couple quick housekeeping items as people continue to trickle in. Um, this is a one hour panel discussion. As I mentioned, please enter questions throughout the chat window in the presentation. And we'll, we'll be recording. You probably noticed that we have the recording uh, light on. So uh, probably following the webinar a uh, couple hours or so, we'll, we'll email it out to, to everybody. And then you can always find the recorded webinars. We always post them right to our website. So if you go to zenmhr.com forward slash HR resources forward slash webinars, you can access all of them there as well. And as I mentioned, there's three other webinars as part of this series. Feel free to register. We have up to 500 spots for each of those webinars. So go to our webinars page, which is located at zenmhr.com forward slash events forward slash webinars. And we also have a weekly podcast that you're welcome to subscribe to on your favorite podcast app. Okay, let's dive in. We got lots to cover. So we have Luke Reese, uh, attorney shareholder at Garrett Human Robertson. We're lucky to have him. And you probably recognize him if you've been to any of our other legal webinars. He's been great. And um, well, he'll probably do the bulk of today's uh, question answering. Uh, we have a segment for him in the middle of the presentation. And then we have Alicia Young. She's our VP of HR Services at Zenium HR and uh, also my cousin. So shout out to her. Uh, and then Susie Weir, VP of People Development and Culture at Zenium. And I am Brandon Laws, the Senior Director of Marketing at Zenium. And I will moderate and be uh, looking for your questions if you have them throughout the presentation. So let's get started. And welcome Susie to the webinar. Hey, Susie. Hello. Hey, so big question for you. Do I need a COVID exposure and response plan? And if so, what should be included? Yeah, well, employees need to be informed of new behavioral expectations, as well as the steps uh, their employer will take to prevent the exposure and spread of COVID as people are coming back into the workplace. So, a documented plan is strongly recommended. Um, there are many elements in this plan and it can get more complex depending on the industry that you're in and the size of the workforce. But some basic information that should be included um, is you know, preventive responsibilities of employees and managers, any screening pr procedures. So if you're gonna be doing uh, pre-screening questions or temperature checks, um, you know, what does that look like? workplace cleaning and disinfecting, uh, PPE, so uh, personal protective equipment, so what will be provided, required, or encouraged. Visitors, so if you have visitors or customers coming into your workplace, um, what are the requirements for, for handling those? Um, privacy and confidentiality of health information, um, and communication and actions taken if there is exposure in the workplace, including record keeping for OSHA. So um, those are kind of the main pieces. We have a reopening workplace guide and sample checklist on our COVID resource page on our website that might be helpful for your planning process. Um, also your safety specialist. So if you work with Xenium, um, might have access to some risk and safety services um, or even OSHA have resources to help you draft plans or even update your current plan to include COVID and infectious diseases. Yeah, on that note, our next webinar is all about safety in the return to work process. So that might be a good webinar for people to sign up for because we do have safety experts coming in and um, they'll answer probably all the questions that people have about safety and, and all that. 
Absolutely. Regarding that checklist and plan that we have for people, is it literally a checklist of, of everything that they should probably include in a response plan? Is it all encompassing there? Yeah, it does help guide you through um, those decisions about how you're going to handle right, workplace safety, um, also your um, policies as it relates to um, not coming to work if you're showing any symptoms mm. of illness, um, how you call in if, if you've made updates to the attendance policies. Um, it includes, you know, ha uh, social distancing requirements, use of common areas in your, your uh, workplace, um, the PPE, the screening, all of those things that I mentioned. Um, so it kind of walks you through. Um, I found personally that it's also helpful to, helpful to have a template um, as well to refer to. Um, so, uh, but I know the checklist at least guides you through that decision-making process of what's appropriate um, and makes sense in your workplace. Yeah. So as an employer, I mean, communications is big on this list of what should I be doing? And, you know, as in regards to communicating to employees and to even customers about how we're reopening our business or returning to work, any of those things, what should we be considering in, as part of the process there? Yeah, so both employees and customers or clients coming into your, your work environment when you reopen they're going to be wondering, they're going to be wondering how safe it is, um, what measures are you taking. So the following types of communication that are recommended include, you know, for employees, how, how you should stay home if you're sick, um, and how physical distancing policies are being used to not only protect employees, but also customers. Um, also implementing training on new workplace safety and disinfection protocols. Um, so before employees physically come back, um, have them receive some training and also share that with your customers. Um, and then you may have sample exposure re response communications ready to go in the event that you have any uh, affected employees and customers. So if an employee is diagnosed, um, you know, what, where were they, um, you know, um, over the potential exposure period, any measures that you've taken as a result, how you're going to maintain confidentiality of medical information. Um, and then depending on your organization and the visibility or size, you may also need to include some media communications or have those ready to release, um, like on topics such as returning to work timetables, safety protections in place, how the company is supporting workers and customers, things like that. You mentioned training. And I'm curious, uh, if, as an employer, how do you uh, launch some sort of training and what, what's recommended for employees before they even return to work? Yes, so we're, we're going to be asking them to um, behave differently. And so <laughs> yeah. it's a change, it's a little bit of a change initiative uh, because people are going to have to, some, some employers may require masks and some may just recommend it when you know you can't social distance. Um, so employees need to know what does that look like? What do the expectations look like? When and how do I use masks? Also cleaning, um, you know, when you use the required disinfectant cleaning um, solutions, you need to wear gloves. And so where are those supplies located? How do I properly do it? How often do I clean um, work, work areas? Also people need to know um, how, uh, do, are there uh, common areas that are um, in use or not in use? Uh, are we staggering schedules to ensure social distancing? And um, what is my schedule, right? What does it look like? Um, trying to think what else. Um, you know, a lot of um, employers are really pushing for as many virtual meetings. So continuing with that as much as possible to limit use of meeting rooms and, and those common areas that tend to you know, collect a lot of germs and where you can't ensure safe social distancing. Um, traffic patterns. So if you're having people move through the workplace and um, setting up traffic patterns to help with that social distancing, people need to know they need to have a map and they need to um, know how to effectively move through the workplace. Um, as I mentioned before, any updates to your policies, attendance policies, how to report 
illness or absences. And I think the probably the biggest thing is having conversations and, and you're, you're likely going to have to do this virtually. So over a virtual training medium, um, but having conversations about how we're all going to support each other in, in enforcing these, these safety and preventive rules. So, you know, give them tips on how to have conversations yeah. uh, with their employees. You know, you may establish some common language so employees feel more comfortable holding each other accountable. So I joked the other day about code words. You know, if you see someone who's yeah. not social distancing or they're not wearing their mask, you can say red light or, you know, something that doesn't feel like a personal criticism. So I think those are really important conversations to have um, up front before people start feeling uncomfortable. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I, I think accountability is huge. Uh, it's really important to make sure the safety plans are kind of upheld and how do you keep people accountable? And it sounds like it's, it's really about having the dialogue up front and keeping, keeping the lines of communication open. So that way it's, it's safe for people to hold each other accountable. Yeah. And we here at Zenium and I know other organizations have even put together a task force. So a few employees who are trying to help coordinate these efforts and will could even help with the training and, and coaching. Um, so that might be an option too. I think in addition to just some virtual training and discussion, having aids, training aids, so signage, other tools, visual tools that are in the workplace to remind people um, of the requirements. There's a couple of questions I want to uh, address that that just came in that are relevant to, to your segment, Susie. So the the web address for the checklist that is on our COVID nineteen uh, support page. So it's zenimhr.com forward slash COVID nineteen, I believe. Yes. Uh, and the checklist is under return to work section, right? Um. Yeah. Wherever you put it. It, I think it's, yeah, it's under that side. There's a lot of information. It's near the top. So those that are asking for it, I think it's under the- That's where it should be. That's yeah. where it should be, yeah. That's where it and should then, be. And then another question that came in, are, uh, is Zenium or you uh, planning to develop any training for staff or templates for policies and safety protocols and things like that, that they could either access for free or, or purchase? <laughs> Great <laughs> question. Um, you know, I, I hadn't planned on developing any training specific to um, reopening work and workplace safety procedures. I think um, our Safety Northwest, which Brandon referred to as being on the next webinar, there are subject matter experts in that, in that area, and so we will leverage them. And I know they've already provided us with some sample signage and posters and tools, and they have training. So I would probably leave it to the experts. And so if anybody wants um, their contact information, especially those who don't work directly with Zenium as a client, I'm sure we can provide that to you. Awesome. Thank you, Susie. Okay, we'll turn to, to Luke now. Um, get all your legal questions answered here. Okay, let me let's see here. Luke, you there? I am. I'm muted. Okay, big question. How should an employer respond if an employee says, I don't feel safe, do I have to come back? Uh, so this is my favorite question to answer right now. And uh, the short answer is, I, I, we have a safe work environment, you're welcome back. If you choose not to, that's your choice, but it's gonna force you to resign. Uh, obviously though, this is a much more nuanced situation than just kind of the law, which is, as long as you've gone through the COVID response plan and made sure that you have the ability to safely work in your place of business and the employee doesn't otherwise qualify for leave, either because they have COVID, they're recovering from COVID, they're taking care of someone who falls into those categories, or they're staying home for some other protected reason. If you don't have any of that, you're allowed to say it's time to return to work. And if you choose not to, then we'll hire somebody who is comfortable. The, the way that I am encouraging everyone to look at this though is think about the consequences and then move backwards so you can avoid those. And really the consequences here come from two different places. The first one is OSHA. 
If somebody complains to OSHA and says, you don't have a safe work environment, they can come in and take action, which usually is either a recommendation on how to do something better, or if you truly aren't putting any effort into it, a fine. I'm really not worried about OSHA as, some, as an entity that's gonna cause you a lot of problems right now. Um, we've already found in the last two months that they really are trying to help people. They're not trying to punish people. So if OSHA gets a call and you can show that you're truly doing your best to try to create a safe work environment, what I'm finding is the really worst that's gonna happen is you're gonna get some strong recommendations on what you can and can't do. Uh, but I'm not particularly worried about that. The, the place that I am worried is my colleagues in the legal industry who are absolutely saliv salivating to start filing lawsuits out of this whole debacle. And I don't want any of my friends or clients to be on their, within their targets. And the way that you avoid that is you try to de-escalate these situations or the concerns that your employees raise at the lowest level possible. And I chuckled when Susie brought up the code words, but I, that, that strikes me as a really important idea because I know where we're gonna get a lot of the friction or where a lot of these situations are gonna escalate is when we have those encounters at work that tick people off, right? When somebody feels like they're being challenged personally or somebody feels like their coworkers or their subordinates aren't taking this as seriously as they'd like, those are the emotional situations that are gonna trigger big problems. So the way that we avoid this is uh, we do a few things. The first one is to take care of everything that Susie just talked about and to really invest the time and energy into creating a workable, customized COVID response plan for your office. That sets the whole foundation of showing that you as a company are taking safety seriously. With that, when employees start saying, hey, I really don't know if I'm comfortable about this, you can have the conversation not in, well, we're gonna tell you what to do and either take it or leave it, but much more collaborative, a real interactive conversation of tell me why you're not comfortable. Make sure that they don't qualify for leave that you would need to process. And, and assuming that's not there, really solicit their input and see if you can put their concerns at ease. I don't think you're gonna be able to completely calm somebody who's hesitant about returning to work but you can create a dynamic that when they have concerns or something happens that makes them scared, they're not gonna immediately turn it into an adversarial situation, but come to you and have the conversation. Um, the thing that I'm cautioning people the most about is I don't think we're gonna see a lot of lawsuits about telling employees, hey, you have to return to work. The lawsuits are gonna come in the form of retaliation allegations where people are gonna say, hey, I, I returned to work, but I felt like I was treated differently because I expressed concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really worried about employees who go online and start really questioning the safety of their workplace and employers coming back and taking action on that. We need to be hyper careful that we are appreciating that employees have the right to be scared. They have the right to ask questions. It's up to us as employers to tell them when it's time to return to work, but we can't start doing anything that could be perceived as retaliation once they're back in the office. Um, that's a very long way of setting up my best advice, which is during this time, it's crucial that we focus on our HR best practices when we have to discipline employees. We need to make sure that we're documenting the reasons why we're disciplining them so we can show that they are completely separate from any safety concerns that have been raised. Th that is going to be absolutely key to make sure that you stay out of the crosshairs of the lawyers who are gonna be looking for the lawsuits out of all this. Let's play out a couple more scenarios. So if an employee says, I'm not ready, I have a compromised immune system or somebody in my family is at risk, um, like a family member, can I continue to work remotely? What do you, what's the right response? And you said collaborative, maybe that's, is a conversation or is, it, is there something more to it? Yep, so the, the first thing is to say, let's have the conversation, right? Um, that, that is a important step that we can't stop. If you just take the request and come back with a yes or no hard answer, you really set yourself up for a problem. But after inviting the conversation, the first step is to get information about why they're making the request. 
if they have a protected reason to be home, we need to go through either the leave process or even the ADA interactive process to see if we can accommodate a true disability. Now, fear of safety is not a true disability. Even if you are of a compromised group, either because of age or your uh, immune system or any kind of health history, that alone does not entitle you to any specific protections. With that said, we do need to go through the process to show that we're really putting an effort into safety. So first step is invite the conversation. Step two is find out if they have some protected reason to be out or to require an accommodation. If there isn't one, then you need to help look to see if working from home is an option or not. Uh, right now, especially given the order that the governor has in place, if it's possible for someone to work from home, we need to allow that just out of pure safety sense. But if it's not possible, we need to help explain the employee to the employee why it's not possible. Either um, you can't serve the clients, you can't do all your job duties, whatever it might be, make sure that you're not skipping the step of sharing why you've made the decision that they have to return to work. The, the next step is to explain everything you've done to make the workplace as safe as possible. And again, solicit any input that your employees may have to even make it better. Once you've done that, then you're at the point where you can say, hey, we, we've, we've done everything we can. You have to be here. We're, we've made the workplace as safe as it can possibly be. If you still don't feel comfortable, we understand, but we need to make a decision and that's gonna be a resignation. Um, I, again, I don't think there's gonna be a huge risk or huge liability if you've gone through all those steps. The key is if the employee kind of begrudgingly says, okay, I need my job, I'm coming back, but I'm gonna be an absolute grump in the process, that you're not disciplining the employee for their attitude, you're really focusing on what they're doing in their work performance, and that's where your discipline comes. Uh, again, those are gonna be the lawsuits. It's the employee who comes back and you fire them because they don't have the positive attitude that you're looking for everyone to help kind of take this next step. Uh, a scenario a lot of parents will find themselves in is uh, with summer coming up, they might rely on summer camps and if they're closed, can they still use the FFCRA leave? Yes. So the FFCRA applies to really anybody that provides childcare and summer camps fall into that category. So if the camp is closed because of COVID-19 reasons, it triggers FFCRA protections just like schools being closed. The, the more interesting scenario is when uh, camps or daycares or wherever, whoever's providing childcare closes because um, they can't afford to run their operations anymore and they don't plan to reopen, right? Uh, a lot of daycares are closing their doors with no expectation of if and when they're gonna return. When you have an employee who's in that situation, you are able to say, look, you need to take effort to find alternative childcare. The, your, your daycare is not closed because of COVID-19, they're closed because of closed. Um, it's a little unclear how hard you can push that, and I'm encouraging everybody to certainly use common sense and be reasonable. But as we move into the summer, with schools not being a real issue, if daycares are closed or it's clear that the employee situation is not gonna return to the way it was before, you can start pushing your employees to find alternative arrangements. For employers who are starting to reopen, get back to work, um, so if they furloughed or laid off employees, how should they go about selecting employees who comes back first? Uh, what, what should they be mindful of in this situation? You, you need to be mindful again about how your decisions would be challenged. And the challenge would have to be you've been discriminatory in how you're choosing whom to bring back. The way that you protect against that is you have a cri objective criteria for who you're selecting. So in a perfect world, you're using the most objective characteristics possible. Length of time with the company, um, different sorts of uh, skills, either educational you know, requirements or um, uh, certification, something like that. If you can't and you need to really make the decision based on who's going to be able to best best serve uh, the, the jobs that need to be done, you're bringing back your best employees, right? 
then you need to try to create a criteria of how you're determining who the best employees are before you start announcing who's coming back. If you can show that you went through that analysis beforehand, you're gonna be in a much better spot to defend yourself than if you're scrambling to come up with a justification for your thought process once somebody raises a challenge. Uh, the other thing that I think is probably key to avoid in the rehiring process is again, not discriminating against those people who are expressing frustrations or concerns about coming back. I think that's, as I explained earlier, really is where the, the lawyers are gonna be focused on pursuing potential claims are those of, I only wasn't brought back because I was the person who stood up and said, you're not doing this in the safest way possible. Let's talk about employer liability. Should employers be, have an employee sign a release statement, uh, a form of some sort that says, hey, I'm healthy? Uh, so, you know, release, I've been preparing a lot of releases in the last couple of weeks. And what I'm telling everybody who requests them is they're not really effective to protect you from liability. Uh, for a lot of different reasons, it's really difficult for me to draft something that an employee signs and then we're not going to get sued if something goes wrong later. But they can be a really effective tool for helping make sure everyone's on the same page and for helping to counsel employees who aren't following the rules that you've laid out. So what I'm encouraging, if, if, that, if you think that's gonna be an effective tool, is create these waivers, not so much as sign here and you're never gonna be able to sue us, but more of an acknowledgement. So you know, here's the COVID response plan, here's what we're asking you to do to help us carry this out, and, and you're signing here to acknowledge your commitment to that. And then if you have somebody who, uh, after giving them the code word, still isn't following the rules, you can bring out that document and use it to, to coach them through and ultimately to discipline if they're not following the, the criteria that you set out. The question that I see come up quite a bit is um, around temperature checks and other screenings. So am I legally required as an employer to, to provide an enforced PPE, health screening, temperature checks, anything like that? So the, the governor's office has laid out the specific requirements for certain industries, and I'd start by looking there. But ultimately, you're, you're not required, nor are you prohibited. Um, you know, this is a really bizarre time for health, employee health screens, whereas previously they were extremely difficult to do and really not advisable. Now you can, and you can do it with relatively low liability. Uh, I think the keys here, if you're wanting to go down that road, is one, make sure you have no, someone who knows what they're talking about, telling you how to do it in the right way. Uh, this is not something you want to invent yourself. So investing on a, either a medical professional or somebody who has some training in this is important. And then carrying it out across the board. Uh, you don't want to single out individual groups of employees or individuals in a way that could be perceived as targeting someone. Uh, but as long as you do that, you, you really are allowed to do whatever you think is going to be safest for your particular environment. I'm sure a lot of employers are thinking, what are the financial implications of if somebody gets COVID-19? Uh, so if employers take a really good faith effort to reduce the exposure. They, they go through the checklist. They um, you know, keep their distance. All of the things that employers should be doing, but somebody gets it. What could like a, a, a worker's comp like vulnerability be if somebody does get it? Like what kind of exposure are we looking at? So I'm encouraging everyone to not worry about the workers' comp exposure. Uh, it's there. If somebody gets ill on the job, they potentially have a workers' comp claim. But the thing about comp that you need to keep in mind is it's no fault. So it doesn't matter if you did it on purpose or, or took every step possible and someone still got sick if they're able to connect the sickness to work, they're gonna have comp benefits. The cost of that really is contained though. Uh, it's not a new risk, right? Um, we have claims because of workplace illness uh, really quite frequently, you know, whether it's asbestos claims or all the way down, and they're not needle movers on your comp rates. The much bigger exposure is retaliation for someone who expresses they might wanna explore a comp claim. So I'd be way more worried about doing anything that an employee could perceive as discouraging them for questioning about comp claims or uh, going down that road. That's the real exposure is a workers' comp retaliation claim or something like that. 
if an employer didn't have any sort of business continuity plan, uh, including like an infectious disease control plan, if they didn't have that prior to COVID-19, should they have one? Should they create that? I, I think absolutely. Now, what that looks like is going to be really different depending on your circumstances and how much you can invest in it. But showing that you put effort into it is going to be helpful in responding to whatever may be thrown your way down the road. Uh, like, you know, we started off with setting that good foundation of showing that you took workplace safety seriously is going to be the backdrop of your defense for whatever claim may come, whether it's a failure to rehire, a worker's comp claim, or, or anything in between. Since we have a few more minutes before we, we start with Alicia, uh, there's a question that came in I thought was really interesting. So just going back to the the uh, scenario of like, I don't feel safe, do I have to come back? What, is, what about the, like, the mental health aspect of people who um, – maybe want to come back because they, their lives are totally disrupted. They want like the normalcy of coming into the office, but employers aren't right, quite ready to bring people back and they don't have all the protocols set in place. Like, are, is there anything protected about anxiety and fear, anything like that? Yeah. And, and this is, this is going to be something that's going to occupy the HR world for, for the foreseeable future. It's, I am anxious about, doing what I'm being asked to do at work. And that, for the most part, is going to trigger disability protections. But that doesn't mean we have to excuse people who are anxious from doing the job. What it means is we have to go through that interactive process to see if there's a way to accommodate the anxiety. That likely is going to be involved helping get as much information as we can from the employee and their healthcare provider about what really is going on and I don't say that to minimize mental health, but it's, it's hard for those of us not with professional training to understand. So it's getting that idea of, okay, if you have anxiety, what triggers it? What can you do to, um, to address those symptoms? And then how do we bring those into the workplace? So getting that information and then helping the employee understand that the accommodation isn't going to be not doing your job, but it's gonna be finding ways to do your job in the safest way possible. And that's looking at working remotely, at the, the physical setup of, at work if someone can't work remotely. It's um, working with the employee to help deal with the anxiety if they're starting to have an attack. Um, when I've worked with doctors who I really respect, that seems to be the most common accommodation. It's the employee really can do their job pretty much normal unless they're having an attack. And obviously we can't anticipate all the time when that's gonna happen. So it's helping put in place um, kind of an understand procedure if an employee needs to uh, take a break. It can be that simple. I need five minutes to go you know, meditate or do my exercises to help um, make this pa panic attack come and go. And that really is an easy accommodation for most people to make. Uh, what I see though that, that I think is gonna be a problem is employers don't have that conversation and they immediately go to well, we can't accommodate that. You're just going to have to do your job. And if you can't, then, then resign. Uh, and, and it's skipping that process that's going to get people into the expensive problems that we want to avoid. Well, one more quick question before we transition. Uh, what sort of PPE is recommended for office environments? Masks, gloves, anything else? So no one really knows yet because offices aren't completely open. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen in the paper or just walking around town, everybody is do trying different things. Um, I, I think right now what we know to be kind of the accepted best practices is masks or face coverings, um, whatever those may be. It's making sure that you have cleaning protocols and cleaning supplies that are readily available so we can get those areas clean. And then physical barriers are gonna be important. I know we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that at the next seminar and I encourage people to uh, invest their time to see kind of what physical barriers are available. From my perspective of making sure you can defend yourself if someone challenges it, it isn't so much the specific PPE that's used. It's showing that you investigated what PPE is available and put some thought into what you were going to put in place in, in the workplace. So as you attend like our next presentation or you consult with contractors, or you do whatever it is you're gonna to do to investigate the PPE, 
I'd encourage you to document that so that if you're questioned in a year about what steps you took, you have that documentation someplace to, to, to defend the steps that you took. Thanks, Luke. All right, Alicia, you're up. Uh, I'm trying to unmute you. Can you, oh, there we go. There we go. How you doing? Good. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, you you lead a team that's working with a lot of small, medium-sized organizations. You're hearing all sorts of concerns. What are the top things that you are really feeling, uh, your team is feeling that you're supporting clients with regarding reopening mm -hmm. the workplace? Yeah, you know, I think that we, um, I think that we're navigating similar, similar situations to what Susie and Luke just talked a lot about is the how to reopen. Um, I'm going to pivot in a little bit of a different direction because there's a whole nother layer and it's on the personal side. Um, the, the situation that we're in right now is so personal to each individual and how they and their family feel about, about what's happening. So um, we're taking a lot of calls um, with employers that are trying to figure out how to do right by their employees um, because we, have, we do, we have some folks that wanna come back. We have some folks that are saying, I'm not ready to come back. And so they're really trying to figure out how to maneuver and reopen the business um, based on what's really right for the business, but also what's really right for the team members. Um, mental health, um, kind of in a touch on that, we are fielding a lot of calls and just in the last, I would say two to two and a half weeks, um, specific to mental health and reopening. So I think that there is a lot of anxiety um, with people and their personal situations around how they're gonna manage through this, um, whether or not they're gonna have a job, not have a job, um, whether or not the daycares are going to open for the camps. And so, you know, we're a lot of what we're dealing with right now is just the real personal aspect down to each individual um, employee that, um, that employers are worried about. Susie talked about uh, communication early on in her segment. And I'm curious if there's any formal way to, that employers can communicate with staff to understand their individual needs, mm -hmm. uh, surveys, one-on-ones, what do you think? Yeah, I think all of that. Um, we are definitely seeing lots of surveys go out. We've held lots of clients um, draft survey questions to go out that asks employees about their, their personal situation. How do you feel? Um, is there something you would like to talk about? Do you wanna be in a phase one reopening or do you wanna be on the latter side of a phase two or phase three of coming back into um, the workplace? So what we're seeing is a lot of employers are, instead of making all the decisions themselves, they're putting it in the hands of some of the uh, task force or the employees and they're engaging in kind of what Luke talked about, right? Is not necessarily always the interactive process, but somewhat a, a, a COVID version of the interactive process to help support everybody. Um, you know, and then there's this, there is that whole layer of people, employers are definitely in this phase right now where they're trying to be, bring people back and people are saying absolutely not. So we're, all, we're already starting to see some challenges with um, businesses getting, having the ability to pick back up where they left off two or three months ago. If employers are collecting the data through a survey of some sort, what's the, you know, the obligation or not necessarily obligation, but what's the right thing to do as far as following up with, here's the action plan or here's what, here's what we heard from you and then what do you do with it at that point? Yeah, I think that this is the, um, this is the time for leadership to be real leaders in organizations. So um, whether or not it's, um, it starts with the senior leadership team um, all the way through middle management and supervisors on the floor, um, but this is the time where we have to be fully engaged with all of our staff members. So, um, you know, it, we're, we're away from the time where we could go two or three days without talking to somebody, right? But now we have to have our one-on-ones. We have to be talking to them about what's going on and what's happening. Um, and uh, I think specific to the survey, you should never, even outside of COVID, um, you should never do a survey without follow-up of some sort. You, you'll hear our kind of HR best practice harping on that all the time. But um, it, I think that certain, certain circumstances will require us to have one-on-one -on -one individual conversations with team members. Um, but I think that as a general 
um, as a general rule, we should also be talking to the entire staff about the common themes and what we're working on and where we're headed. Um, I think there needs to be a lot of communication out from leadership, whether or not that's via email, um, Zoom calls, um, pulling the entire team together, giving consistent and fast status updates around where the business is at financially, where the business is at with their reopening, um, and the plans that are being put in place and reviewed to make everybody comfortable so that, like Luke mentioned, and we get to that spot where we're starting to pull people back in and asking them to come back, hopefully we've already decreased the amount of anxiety people have around what we've already done. How are employers addressing and evaluating long-term or permanent requests for remote work? I know this is coming up a lot. Yeah, it, it's starting to really bubble. So I think that as we know, many years now, there's been more and more remote workers. Um, and there's been some, sometimes people will say it's great. And then other times people are pulling back <clears throat> saying, I don't want it anymore, you know, companies. Um, but I think what COVID just did was it just pushed us into the future. Yeah. With remote working. So if we thought we had 10 more years to have a, um, not as many remote workers, you know, and just a few here and there, we, we need to be really be thinking about our, the future of the businesses and, and what we're doing, and how we're doing it with more remote workers. The nice thing also opens us, us up to a whole nother layer of staff. Yeah. You know, I mean, talk about the talent we can get um, by having the right technology and tools in place to do business um, all across the U.S., you know, or even globally. Globally, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think that um, businesses are absolutely taking this time to really pivot and start thinking about how do they do business, how do they want to do business into the future, um, and what does that look like for the employees? What's your take on, you know, big organizations, global organizations like a Twitter, Facebook, that are coming out and saying, you know what, I think we might just do this whole remote thing permanently? Yeah, yeah. It puts, it puts pressure on a little bit. Um, I, everybody knows I'm a people person. Yes, so, you are. um, the thought of not having people around, um, it's giving you anxiety. I know it totally does. I'm the one with anxiety now. Um, no, but I think it's real. I think it's real. Um, I think again, we just, we just fast forward into the future 10 years or so, maybe even 15 when it comes to remote work and people wanting a lot more flexibility. Um, I think this was a, a, a time period where people are assessing their family values, um, you know, and, and what they're doing at, at, at home, um, wanting to be more comfortable, whether or not that's the dress code or having to just go into the office. Um, I think that we're there. So, um, it's going to be more challenging to try to go back to um, the way we used to do it, where we're saying, I don't believe in remote workers. I want everybody here next to me. Um, that is, that's already kind of, a, you know, a, a different way of thinking or a, um, a, a kind of an old school way of thinking, I want to say. So we're going to have to start thinking a little different. And actually, we're fielding um, on the HR team a lot of those conversations now around, um, I want everybody here because of the culture. We This is how we build culture. This is how we build a team. This is how we build camaraderie. Um, some will say that we've built all of that and even more because of the capabilities over um, technology. Yeah. So you know, if, if employers are adapting to this, this remote work as a permanent arrangement, are there any policies or anything that we need to be updating as employers uh, to, um, to adapt to this new world? Yeah. yeah. I think the reality is, is remote working doesn't work for everybody. Mm -hmm. So putting in uh, expectations around, um, what positions can really remote work? There are always going to be some positions that absolutely um, cannot um, have a remote piece of their job, you know? So what, what do those positions look like? And what are the expectations? So making sure to say, you know, maybe from a business perspective, we don't want everybody working remotely five days a week. Maybe we want to say, hey, we want to give everybody a little flexibility. Um, and so let's, let's do a rotational every two days or, or you get, everybody gets to pick three days a week where they're not coming in. Um, so having policies in place to set the tone for what the organization um, 
wants and will um, accommodate. Because if we start to just accommodate one-offs all the way across the organization, that could start to get a little tricky. Um, and then very easily could you start having uh, folks say, well, this is what you do for this person over here. And I'm in a different role, but it's similar type of tasks. So why can't I do it too? So I think setting those parameters in your handbook, in policies, maybe even having some separate and distinct policies outside of your handbook for people that do work remotely and agreements that you have together of how often they're checking in, um, how accessible they are and what they're doing when they're remote. Yeah, I'm sure that's a question that comes up a lot is like, how do I know if my employees are actually working? Oh, yeah. I, I uh, ran across this article that was pretty disturbing, but I imagine it's, it's out there where employers are using like tracking information or software that's, it like takes screenshots of, of um, what they're doing at any, any given time in this. I think it was a I want to say it was a New York Times article. Lacey Partipillo and I did a podcast on it and just discussed it at length. But is this really happening? Do you, do you hear any clients using software like this? Seems not crazy. a ton. Um, I mean, it is happening because obviously people are talking about it, right? Yeah. But I, I think that for the most part, um, people don't come to work to do a bad job. Yeah. Um, and, and we as leaders, if we're doing our job as a leader, um, we should we should know if our team members are pulling their weight or not. You know, maybe I don't know exactly what time my team logs in every single morning and, and gets off, but honestly, I don't know that I care. What I care about is our clients being supported. Are we um, getting deliverables out? You know, so I'm really focused on the um, – what the team members are are doing externally, you know, so what are you delivering and, and am I not getting complaints from clients? So it, yes, people are doing that. Um, I, I, I don't know how far that will go with employees long-term. I think there'll be a lot of employees that figure out that their employers monitoring them to that degree and they probably aren't going to want to work for that employer um, potentially, but We'll see how, how far that goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. Um, so we're going to transition into the, to the questions. We're getting a bunch of them in. Um, unfortunately, my, my uh, questions panel froze, <laughs> and I can't see the uh -huh. new questions. Susie, I'm going to ask you, are you able to see some of the questions coming in? Yes. Okay, good. So I'm, I have a few more that came in through the registration that I'll ask. And then if you don't mind jumping back in and, and, and doing the moderation for the last part, that would be amazing. Uh, good, good old technology, right? Um, real quick, I put the resources that we had mentioned uh, earlier um, up on the screen so you can access those there. Uh, on this page that we have on the Zenium website, the COVID-19 page, there are so many resources. You're talking about old webinars, new webinars, resources from around the web, CDC recommendations, all that stuff. So go there. You probably have everything in, you need and more from there. Okay, so let's uh, dive into some of the questions and please continue to use the, the panel, the qu questions and ans answers panel to uh, submit some new questions. So. Um, I'm not sure who this question would be geared towards, but anybody can jump in. So should I consider a pay equity audit as workers return as pay may have been reduced or frozen, or, I mean, as time goes by, things may have changed uh, market wise. Um, I don't know who wants to answer that. Maybe Alicia. Yeah. I think that we have to always be reviewing pay equity, no, no matter what situation we're in. Um, I'm not sure that you have to immediately run out and do a pay equity audit. Um, but I definitely think that as you bring people back into the workforce, you definitely need to be looking at um, who's doing what work at what rate of pay and, and why aren't you bringing them back to their old pay before? Is it because there's a significant change in their duties um, or, and, did you have some people that are still currently working? Some people are off because maybe they have kiddos at home. Um, and did you reduce the pay because of that? And so what, what were the reasons that, um, that you reduced the pay to begin with? Um, and then continuing to evaluate it. Over time, do I think you should probably do a pay equity audit to just make sure you're in alignment um, with where you were at and the goals of the organization going forward? Absolutely. I'm not sure you have to run out and do it right away, um, but you should definitely keep it on the forefront. If um, employers start bringing back employees, but 
can only do so to reduce schedule. What are uh, some options to support employees? You guys want me to go again? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody can jump in. Um, so, so, you know, again, it's looking at, Luke mentioned this earlier, um, what are the reasons why they're, we're going to a reduced schedule? Are we going to reduce schedule because that's all the work? That, that, um, that's coming in the building right now. So we don't have enough work to go around. Um, so keeping some team members on work share or maybe even implementing work share, if you haven't implemented work share before, um, putting folks on, um, letting them collect unemployment for half of the time. Um, but then there could be situations where people are coming back part-time because of a protected leave of some sort. Um, and so looking at what protections are there that you need to make sure to have folks on um, a part-time basis and, and, and the why and then the proper paperwork and, and whatnot. And, and being able to articulate the, the reason that you went through the analysis before you implemented it, it's really important. So, um, you know, it doesn't need to be anything terribly formal, but here's, you have a documented an explanation of why you've made the changes that you've made. And then definitely make sure that you're not um, accidentally running afoul of wage and hour laws. So a, someone who may have been an exempt employee may well have no, no longer qualify for that, um, depending on how they've been brought back. And I think that's a step that a lot of people are forgetting to do that could have pretty significant consequences. Uh, so do employers need to notify state unemployment agencies of recalled workers, whether they're rehired or not? Yes, as the short answer. Now, the employment department, if you've been reading the paper, is weeks and weeks and weeks behind in processing these claims, but it is important to, to update unemployment on what the status is of employees who have been offered their jobs and not brought back. Now, it may not have a negative impact on benefits. That's really not our decision to make, but it is our obligation to get truthful information out uh, there's going to be a wave of uh, employment department audits, you know, probably years down the line, but looking back to this point in time. So it's important that we're taking that responsibility seriously. All right, Susie, I'm going to turn it over to you and you can field some of the live questions. Okay, so one question is um, some of our employees visit customer homes. Um, so whether it be customer homes or customer offices, can we ask those employees to pre-screen the customers or clients prior to entering um, by using a standard set of questions? Y yes, you may. Um, now you, you need to be reasonable in the questions that you ask, but the same sorts of questions that we're allowed to ask our employees, we can ask of customers whose homes we are going into. Um, you know, I, 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 again, you want to have a process for that so you're not putting the obligation on your employees to come up with it on the spot, but there's not going to be really any risk in doing that. There could be risk in not doing that. Okay. Uh, another question is, can employers prohibit employees from using the lunchroom? Yeah, prohibit is a word that I, I, I don't want to be using, um, but yes, you can say we're not going to use the lunchroom because we can't do so safely. Um, if you have a workforce who takes giant issue with that, I would say it's time to take a step back and understand why before you take a, a hard line stance. But we, we as employers not only can, but really have an obligation to set out parameters on what the workplace is going to look like. Um, when these physical distancing responsibilities are out there. Okay. Um, another question, a lot of these are compliance related um, or employer requirement related. Um, if the, uh, based on business, the lack of business coming in um, or lost business, um, there needs to be a layoff of folks. Um, what are your concerns about including people in that layoff who are covered under FF, right, Siri, so the FICRA? Yeah, it, it, it's a concern, right? If we're laying somebody off, it's an adverse action. And if somebody falls into a protected characteristic, if they can connect the decision to lay off to that, we've got liability. But I wouldn't be overly worried about it. If you truly have an economic need to do a layoff, 
and you've created a criteria of who's selected and who's not, everybody's going to fall into some protected characteristic and FFCRA is just another one of those. So I wouldn't be frozen or uh, not make a decision because of that, but it really does emphasize the importance of being able to articulate why someone was selected. And again, the more objective, the better. The other thing that I'm helping people understand is you need to create that criteria, not based on necessarily what makes the most sense to you, but what makes sense to someone who's not familiar with your company. So it's great to talk to somebody who doesn't really intimately know how you operate and explain how you made the decision so that someone who's coming in without any context, without any perspective, can say, yeah, that makes sense. Or if they have questions, you get those questions answered before you start laying people off. And I would also add to, you know, um, when, when organizations started doing layoffs or furloughs at the beginning of COVID, you know, back in the middle of March, um, they were moving so fast and so furious that a lot of these, um, the thought process around why they did what they did um, wasn't documented or um, wasn't really articulated. It was just, uh, you know, we have to shut down all operations, everyone goes home and everyone's furloughed or, or something similar to that effect. Um, and maybe it was department specific or whatnot. But if employers are going to, um, be really looking at the the last half of the year and saying I really need to make some adjustments um, to what the business the normal business structure looks like now I would say work with your HR partners whoever that might be to make sure to document things properly because um, Luke is right there are going to be folks that are on all different types of protected leaves um, or have all different types of statuses that might end up being be protected and so make sure that we're we're um, not moving so fast that we can't slow down enough to really articulate and document the why and, and how we went about that process um, going into the future. Okay. Do we have time for one more, Brandon? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay. So I think this is one that, that people struggle with, even HR folks um, and, and certainly managers. So is there a level when employers are being too accommodating? So like, where's the boundary, <laughs> right? So, you know, obviously you want to um, comply with the disability, you know, laws and you want to be a good employer, but where, you know, how do you kind of determine how far to go? That, I think Alicia said it best when she said, this is the time for leaders to lead. And it all comes down to, someone has to make the decision of where the line's drawn and that person needs to be able to do it confidently and then stick to it. Um, you know, it's going to be different for everybody, but as long as you've gone through these steps that we've talked about and you're at the point where you're comfortable saying we, we're doing this safely, we've looked at whether there are other accommodations that need to be made and we're confident they are not, it's time to make the decision. That, that is the best you can do. Um, I, I fr frankly know from experience, very few lawsuits come out of confident managers who make a decision, explain the reason for it, and stick to it. It's the wishy-washy stuff. It's the going back and forth. It's not being clear communicators. And frankly, it's the people who get caught up in the kind of chitter-chatter uh, that's going on behind the scenes that end up finding themselves on the wrong end of a lawsuit. Okay, that, that uh, brings us to the close. Everybody, thank you so much. Luke, Susie, Alicia, you guys are great. Um, I, the contact information for each of these three are up on the screen, so feel free to, to pepper them with questions if you didn't get your questions answered. Um, and then join us for our next, next webinar. We're talking about safety next week, um, and you can go to our webinars page on our website to see the full schedule coming up. So. Thank you for joining. Great, great group today. Great questions and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.